This is Sasha Samuel and Suwana Vatsananan. We are here at Day Young Museum in San Francisco looking at Girl with a Pearl Earring by Johannes Vermeer. Many critics observed Vermeer's work and exhibited how precisely crafted all of his compositions were. As a classicist, he freshened and glorified what he saw of the visual world. He created images that portrayed timeless truths of human needs and emotions. That's interesting. As a viewer, you feel sort of a keen sense that a profoundly philosophical approach to life underlies his work. His purest form of his classicism is revealed in the timeless beauty and elegance in Girl with the Pearl Earring. This wonderful painting was created in 1665 to 1666. Timeless beauty and elegance are the perfect words to use when looking at this painting. When I look at her, as though the audience would does too, we get a feeling of purity and charm through gaze. And if you look closely at her fair-skinned complexion, you see how smooth her skin is and unblemished, just like the surface of her earring. That's right. It's like you can reach out and feel how soft her face is. Also, the blue glaze in the turban contributes to the sense of sort of a immediacy. To enliven her face, Vermeer placed light accents in her eyes. And, as was recently discovered in the 1994 restoration of this painting, it also accentuated the extremities of her mouth with small dots of pink paint. It's interesting how little of detail can make such a big difference. Vermeer achieved this softly diffused flesh tones evident here, created by lathering a thin flesh-colored glaze over transparent undermodeling. He developed this technique for rendering the flesh tones during the mid-1660s in paintings such as Women Holding a Balance and Young Woman with a Water Pitcher. Oh yeah, that's right. Vermeer's broad manner of painting allows him to generalize forms and suggest the subtle nuances of light falling across the face. This is a fundamental aspect of classicism, the origins of which are to be found in his early history paintings. This painting also exhibits another aspect of classicism that pervades Vermeer's work, timelessness, like we mentioned before. Set against a dark, undefined background and dressed in an exotic costume, this striking young woman cannot be placed in any specific context, so you don't really know where she is or even who she is. It is the first to focus on a single figure against a dark background. You're right. It is very, very interesting. You have to think a lot to try to get the message out of this painting. It's almost as though she holds no attributes that might, for example, maybe identify her as an allegorical figure, perhaps a muse, or even a sibyl. Hmm, interesting. Oh, certainly, however, it is the very absence of a historic or iconographic framework that conveys such immediacy to all who view her, you know? Now we are here at the Art Institute of Chicago looking at At the Moulin Rouge, painted by Toulouse-Lautrec in 1892 through 1895. This is a time before radio, television, and even film. So the only way to spread the word about the performance of that day, the cabarets used huge, brightly colored posters. Lautrec was at the forefront of the movement, and being involved in, his jumps, in this jump-started his career. Lithography was one of Lautrec's magnificent talents. As you can see, it's demonstrated here. You can see the sleeping lines and the bold colors enriched and developed his art form. He learned much about the use of sharp outlines and pure flat colors from his studies of woodblock prints. That's an interesting way of studying things. It's definitely portrayed in this painting. At the Moulin Rouge, a Paris nightclub, Lautrec found the most interesting and inspiring subjects and characters for his paintbrush. He loved theater and dance, but above all, the artists who performed. He understood how much they had to give in creating their art. The people seated around the tables are similar to the people you would see in nightclubs today, with the exception of their clothing styles. <laughs> That's right. Lautrec believed in capturing the moment, and his art seems to do just that. He frequently took a long time to construct his paintings. He made many sketches and even worked from memory. Memory is a tough thing to work with. This is one of the few pictures by Lautrec in which his interest has shifted from dance floor to the spectators in the surrounding promenade. It's also interesting because we, as the viewers, look at these characters and they, in turn, are looking at each other or maybe in our direction. But if you look closely, you can see that there is no eye contact whatsoever. 
The patrons seem to be lost in thought, but this whole piece captures the noisy and brightly lit atmosphere of the cabaret, and it almost seems as if you're in there in person. Yeah, it's like as, as if he took a picture of the cabaret. It makes me want to go there. Doesn't it make you want to go there? Yes, it does. The off-center placing of the principal group was a technique learned from the artist they got. The mask-like face lit from below is coupled with the abrupt diagonal of the balustrade, or the bar, which had to be prolonged, and it encloses the principal group in a sort of V-shape, and, the, and it draws the eye right to the middle of the picture. I was just about to say that. The V-shape draws the eye. Very well put. Also note how the diagonal is emphasized, and especially how an illusion of space is created by converging diagonals on the floorboards. As you can see, diagonals actually are very uh, important in this painting. And this one is actually one of his greatest and most imaginative pictures. I agree. The curious but suggestive color harmony in yellow, orange, and green is related to his experiments in poster designing. But the part that we haven't talked about yet is that creepy and almost frightening face on the bottom right. Uh, yes, we cannot forget that one. A lot of people will ask why Mae Milton was created that way, and the answer is no one really knows. After Lautrec died, someone actually tried to cut her face out of the canvas. No one really is sure why it was done, but later the strip was sewn back onto the canvas. That's, that's really funny. This shows that as scary as a face may be, you can realize that even though it's really strange, Mae Milton's face makes the painting that much more unique and unusual, but equally more interesting.